Hey guys, how's it going? So today I want to talk to you about the farming system in Farthest Frontier. It's a somewhat complicated system that has a lot going on with it, and a lot of people have many, many questions about crop rotations, uh, field size, when to build farms, how many farms should I have, how does spoilage work, all these different things. So we are going to jump in there and we are going to talk about all of these different mechanics with the farming system and how you can best utilize it for yourself in the early game when you're first starting out. That way you'll have a good handle on it and can expand your knowledge with it throughout the game and keep with your farming. Before we even get into the farming, there's a few things you should know about the map types. That's going to really determine how much farming you can do and what your fertilities will be. Lowland Lakes has the easiest source of fertilities on the map. You're going to have the most fertility on a lowland lakes map. Plains and alpine valleys have quite a bit as well. Alpine valleys slightly less, but plains does have a, a decent amount of fertile valleys on it as well. Alpine valleys slightly less. Arid highlands is going to be pretty difficult. It has very little fertile land on it, so you're going to have to kind of pay attention to that. So the map type you choose if you choose random, you're just going to have to see what you get and decide how you're going to best utilize your fertilities available to you. So one of the most important things when it comes to farms is where are your fertilities when you are placing your town hall? If we press F on the keyboard, that brings up the fertility overview and we can get an idea as to where all the fertile land is. Now we can see a very large piece of the map when we are first deciding where to put our town hall. You can scroll around quite a ways to see where all of your fertile land is. And my goodness, look at this. This is what we call heaven right here, okay? This is what we call heaven. Look at all of this good fertile land and especially pay attention to this. That, that This dark blue green right here is highly, highly fertile land. So we're going to want to settle really close to that. Other things obviously are really important, such as mineral resources and uh, foraging and things like that. But these darker blue-green areas are really, really crucial. So you, we want to settle near that. You don't want your farms too far away from where your settlement is going to be. So choose a location that is close by to your resources, to water if you have it, and to your fertile land. For this particular scenario, I would say somewhere right around in here, right in between the water and this fertile land, would be a good ideal location for me. It's close to a lot of good resources, and I think it would be a uh, an excellent starting location. So you've got your initial settlement going, you've got people working, you've got some food coming in from places like fisheries, foraging huts, and hunting cabins. So when should you build farms? Well. Kind of the rule of thumb is you really don't even need farms until somewhere maybe around 50 population. Foraging, hunting, fishing, smokehouses, stuff like that will actually last you quite a while in terms of food production. You will have to do a little manual moving, uh, especially like if you're foragers huts, you may have to, you'll have to manually move around those target locations as different crops come into different seasons. But overall, you should be perfectly fine and you shouldn't have to worry about uh, building farms early on. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. Just be aware that, you know, you will need some extra workforce for them. Anywhere from one to three workers to kind of get started. And that's just people that aren't going to be laborers going around and gathering resources for you. So just be aware of that. So once you're ready to place your first farm, how big should you make it? Well, the standard size is five by five. That's as small as you can go with these right here is a five by five. And it's going to give you a maximum of 550 yields if it, all conditions are perfect. I'm going to make an argument to go up to a 5x6, okay? It's going to give you 110 more yield maximum. So you're going to get a little bit more still out of one worker. I wouldn't go up to a 5x7. You're not, you don't get that much more and you need an entire other worker. Now, you could go to a 5x10. That would give you 11 100. So that's actually even better. The 5 by 10 gives you double the amount of the 5 by 5. But for right now, when workforce is low, stay with just one worker. I would go with a 5 by 6. We'll plop that down. We're going to have 81% fertility, which is amazing. 
Now, when you are placing your farms, make sure that it is close enough to your settlement that the travel time will be low and leave some space around it when you're doing your roads because you're going to want to wall it in. I'm going to go ahead and plop him down right there. He won't start building right now because it is too cold. So he will start building that in the second year. So we're going to skip ahead in time until this farm is finished. All right, so at long last, you have your first crop field up and running. It is there. It is ready to be used. Then there's this massive UI that has all this stuff on there. That's like, oh, God, what is it? Well, that's not too hard. Let's just talk about it real quick. What this is, is this is year one, year two and year three. Each of these little uh, sections dictates a month. And then you can see it goes, it follows basically along with up here. It goes from, you know, late winter, early spring, all into uh, the, the middle of winter down here. So it goes, you know, when, start of the year to the end of the year, January to, you know, December, basically. Uh, in the middle, you've got summer. So that is, that's all these are. So these are your first, second, and third years. The shaded part right here is how your or the time that has already passed. And then the, the part that is unshaded is the time that is to come. And it still, it matches up with what's up here. We're in late summer. This right here is showing that we are in late summer. This is how many workers are assigned to it. This right here is some of the most important information right here, your yield factors for crops. You have your fertilities, weed levels, the rockiness of the soil, and then the soil mixture. And then down here, once we have a crop, it will be the estimated yield for that crop for that year. That is all this information is right here. And that's all very, very crucial to getting your farm up and running properly. So if we click add crops, it will bring up all of the different crops and all the different things that we can do with the fields. All you ought to do is simply add them to the list for that year. And then you can also drag them around. If you want to, let's say, you know, I, I decide I want something else grown at the beginning of the year. Well, I can move, you know, the turnips to the end, the beans over to that side and then add something else at the beginning. So you can slide these around as you want. It's also very helpful to slide them around so you can get a better yield out of some stuff, depending on when you are harvesting them and depending on um, their tolerance. So everything has different tolerances and we'll take a look at that shortly. So you can move them around to have them growing in their at in their appropriate temperature levels. If you want to remove something, you just click clear selected crop and it will take it off the board. Now, this button right here is expand field. That's exactly what it sounds like. It will let you go down and add on to this field and add another section on. That's all that is. That way you don't have to destroy the field. You just add on to it. So let's take a look over here at the different crops and all the different information on them. We have crop yield. That is exactly what it sounds like. It is how much food you will get out of that particular crop. The frost tolerance and the heat tolerance, again, self-explanatory. How tolerant are they to certain temperatures? That's very important for when you want to grow them. Rockiness resilience uh, dictates how if it how if the soil is really rocky, you know, will you still get a good yield out of it? Something that has a really low rockiness resilience will give you less yield because of how rocky the soil might be. Weed suppression will determine how much uh, how much weeds it can handle before you start losing any crop yield. Grow time again, self-explanatory. How quickly does this grow now? The last two are the kind of the ones that I think are the most important. Fertility impact and fertility dependence. So the impact on fertility is very important. We have an initial rating of 81% fertility. We take a look at the beans right here. The beans have a positive impact on fertility. They will raise the fertility by plus two. Take a look at something, however, like turnips, they decrease the fertility by two. Now this will change the base fertility right here. So if we planted beans, we are actually going to raise the fertility slightly by around 2% for this field. However, if we plant turnips, it will lower this down to around 79%. So it will adjust that number. That is something really important you have to keep in mind when you are doing your crop rotations. 
The final thing is fertility dependence. And this one is a little backwards from what it might seem. The lower the number, the less the fertility matters. Okay? So, beans have a fertility dependence of 6 out of 10. So, you can get away with a slightly lower fertility and it won't have as big of an impact. If you take a look at something like cabbage, it has a high fertility dependence. So, it needs very fertile soil in order to grow and get the best yield out of it. This is why you have to make sure you're putting your farms in the highest fertility areas you can find. Because that fertility dependence, depending on what you want to grow, is going to matter for that. You know, something like wheat has an extremely high fertility dependence, and wheat is very important later on because it does allow you to start making bread, which is going to be a staple food source in the future. So, what do we need to do here? Oh, I, I, I completely forgot. Skip back. There's two very important things at the bottom. Maintenance and clover. Maintenance is your farmers going into the field and cleaning it up. It will reduce the weed level and remove rocks from the field. This is very, very important. Weeds continue, continue to grow over time. Weed suppression helps lower the rate at which they grow, and it can lower it slightly, but you'll need to do maintenance to remove weeds. Clover increases the fertility by plus five. Clover has no food value, so it's not a crop, but what it does is it restores the fertility by plus five to your fields, so it's really, really good. So, now we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of this thing, the crop rotations. So before you even get started growing crops, we need to get this field ready. What I recommend doing is running three runs of maintenance. Now, if you, if you timed this just right, and I did not, you should be able to get a full one year as soon as the farm is up and running. That means basically you need to, as soon as you start building your initial settlement, go ahead and get a farm field down so someone can start working on it. I didn't do that, you know, and that's okay. Again, you have a while until you really need the farm. So we're going to throw in one run of maintenance. Now I'm already almost through this year, so I'm just going to move him down here. And we're just going to go ahead and get that maintenance going. Then I'm going to come into the second year and add two more runs of maintenance. This should get us down to around 30, 20 to 30% weed level and almost remove all of the rocks. That's going to be really, really important for our food growth and our yields. Uh, we want that going. That way we get the most bang for our buck. So either do three runs in a full year if you have it. If not, you know, however you need to work it around, just do three runs of maintenance back to back to get the field ready. Then you're ready to start growing your crops. So in our second year, after our two runs of maintenance, I need to see what I can do. Now, if I go to click the beans, you'll see that it says not enough room to add crops. This is the end of the growing season. So I have to pick something that has three and a half months or less of growing time. And I need to find that. So what I could look for is something like possibly turnips. Turnips would not be a bad one. Carrots or peas. Any one of these would do pretty well. Let's take a look at all three of them and see the differences. So if I go to do turnips, turnips are done in about three months, roughly. You can see, however, that our soil is not that good for turnips and we aren't and we're getting a negative 1% uh, decrease to it. We mouse over this exclamation point. It's going to give us a lot of information. We're losing minus five to the fertility. So that's not too bad. We're losing minus two because of the soil. Now we're losing minus 72 because of weed level. But we know we're going to get at least a portion of that back. So let's maybe say we'll get around mm, minus 20 or so. Minus 20 from weed level once we have the weeds taken out. So that's going to probably give us somewhere around a yield estimate, a yield estimate of let's say maybe 160 in those three months, once we figure in the weeds and stuff. About 160 is what I would figure. That's not too bad. Take a look at the carrots. 
The carrots are done in about, uh, what is this? Three and a half months, okay? Now this one right here, we're losing a lot to the weed level. But again, we're going to be adjusting that. And so we can probably say that we're going to get somewhere around mm, maybe 320-ish. Figure maybe somewhere around 320 or so. Somewhere within that range. Uh, we would know more after this right here. So between the carrots and the turnips, the carrots might actually be better. They have the exact same... Uh, negativity on the fertility. So that's not a big deal. Now, something we do have to keep an eye on is the heat tolerance. As you can see, the heat tolerance between turnips and carrots is pretty, is pretty average. It's not, it's not amazing. That's a three out of 10. And that's a five out of 10. So the turnips are slightly more tolerant to heat. We are planting and harvesting these things we're planting them in the middle of the heat and harvesting them towards the end. So it's a little dicey on the heat. Peas have no heat tolerance. So peas would not, even though we could grow them, I would not recommend growing them because they have no heat tolerance. And we are planting those right in the middle of summer. And I think it would be a bad idea. Unfortunately, we can't grow anything like cabbage, which has a really good heat tolerance, but we can't fit that into our cycle. So we're basically between turnips and carrots. Now, what you grow is basically going to be up to you. Most people are going to say, oh, go turnips. It's the best. And it's really good. Yes, because it does have, you know, a fairly low growing time. It has a, a good a, a good frost tolerance and an OK heat tolerance. Uh, but you could get away with the carrots. There's nothing wrong with it. Experiment around with your fields and see what you like growing. See what works for you. Uh, for me, I think I'm actually just going to go with the turnips on this one. It does have a slightly higher heat tolerance. And I am planting right in the middle. It's not going to give us as big of a yield as the carrots might. But the carrots have such a low heat tolerance. I'm a little worried about the heat of the summer. So we're going to go play it safe and go with the turnips. Now, on the third year is where, we'll, where we will actually get into our true crop rotation and start our first crop rotations. So we're going to take a look at a few different things. Let's first pop up the cabbages. We're going to pop in beans. Beans are a very popular one for everybody. Take a look at the beans. Again, we have to kind of disregard the weed level and figure we're going to get about maybe 75 added back into that for a total yield of somewhere around 290. And uh, we'll take a look at that. And that's not bad. That's not bad at all. About 290 is pretty decent. Now, the soil isn't that great and it's OK. Now, beans have a really high heat tolerance. So these are something we would want to be growing in the summer right around here. Now, for the first of the year, let's take a look at these cabbages. Now, the cabbages actually have a 10% bonus to the soil target because it is almost right in the smack dab center of perfect soil for cabbage. So we're losing 53 to fertility because these things have a pretty high fertility requirement. So we're losing quite a bit to fertility. However, we're gaining 35 from positive rock value. We'll get more as the, the, rock, uh, the rocks go down. We'll get a little bit more. And the weed level will go down. My guess is we are going to get somewhere around 400 for those cabbages. 400. And that's, only, and that's in four months. Four months. Now, what I keep seeing across the internet and people talking about is, oh, no, grow like... You know, do like two things of turnips, you know, and do that back to back. Well, you could. We'll get somewhere around maybe 150 to 200 ish or so. About, you know, so, eh, trying, to, trying to figure out the math in my head. Most people know that me and monkey math don't don't go well together. Um, so about 190 about 190 so somewhere around 380 to 390 for these two months the problem is that you are going to be lowering the fertility by minus four total for both of those and you're planting two crops 
back to back, as well as the turnips we have right here. This is not good. We don't want to do this. It's a lot of lowered fertility right there. I wouldn't want to do this. The cabbages, however, are pretty good. They only lower it by a whopping minus three, so that's not a big deal. We'll get a huge yield out of those. And they are really tolerant to heat and frost, so this is a really good early game thing right here. Now, this is specific for me. Your cabbages might not be that good because of the soil and the soil mixture and everything else. So what my recommendation is, is to look and see what your soil mixture is for the different vegetables and figure out what is best for your soil type. Turnips, beans, and peas are kind of a go-to for everybody because they have short growing times. But at the same time, you're planting a lot of the same stuff over and over, and you're also lowering the fertility more by planting small, constant crops. So look and see what you might want to do based on the different fertilities and the different uh, yield amounts for everything. Cabbage is really good for me, so I'm going to do a run of cabbage. Well, what will I want to do next? Now, this is actually going to be the start of my first year crop rotations. So what I would like to do is try to get as a, the biggest bang for my buck. And what I'm going to do is throw in beans after this. The beans are going to offset some of that negative fertility from the cabbage by raising the fertility a little bit. And it has a really good heat tolerance like we talked about earlier, and it's going to give us a good yield. So I want to skip ahead to where this row right here is done. It comes into the second row, and we're going to set up our second year of crop rotations. I just want to pop in real quick and take a look at our weed and rockiness levels after one run of maintenance. It's gone down by almost 20% on the weed level, and the rockiness has dropped about 6%. So we can figure after two more runs of this, we'll be down to our target level of around 20% weed level, and our rockiness will go down to around 10 to 15%. So that's, that's decent. That's going to give us a good start on our farms and let us get more yield out of our crops. All right, so now we are into the next year and we are ready to do our next run of crop rotation. So we're going to remove this maintenance for a moment and we're going to see what we want to do. So I don't want to do the same stuff back to back. I want to change it up a little bit. I want to put in some peas first. Peas have good frost tolerance. So that's really good for the first of the year. It's going to give us a really, really nice yield as well. Uh, once we get rid of the rest of these little bit of weeds in here, it's going to be extremely good for us. We also get a 10% bonus because of the soil mixture for it. So that's a really healthy option. Then we're going to throw in some more turnips. Throw in a little bit of turnips right there. Now we're going to end the year with some maintenance on the field. We're going to have four runs of crops. We're going to want to make sure we do some maintenance to keep those weeds down. That right there will help uh, ensure that weeds stay down and crops stay up. Now, I'm going to let this run through again. Uh, we will clear out the fields two more times and we'll see what our weed level is at. And we'll get through. then we'll get through this little bit of turnips and we'll bring up the final year in the rotation. And we will see what we want to do from there. All right, jumping in real quick. We are done with all of our maintenance. We're down to 15% weed level. So that's going to give us almost a perfect yield of, crop, of turnips. It's going to give us right now over a perfect yield of cabbages the next year. Same thing with the peas. Oh, I'm sorry, not the peas, the beans. Uh, now, this is going to change slightly because we will get a few more weeds coming in. But this right here is why I think doing three runs of maintenance back to back is so important at the very beginning. Don't worry about the food just yet. Worry about getting those weed levels down so you get the most crop that you can. All right, so I will be back in just a moment once we have the the, um, this cycle right here down, and then we can take a look at what we want to do in the third year, and then we'll talk about the final crop rotation and things you might want to think about later on as you watch your fields to see what they are doing. All right, so we have rotated to another year now, and I want to take a look at this last row. For this last one right here, I think I'm going to throw in another thing of cabbages. 
But instead of doing beans next, I'm going to just do clover. The reason I'm going to do clover is because I want to reset the field, essentially. I want to reset it, get the fertility way on back up, because it is going to be lowered a little bit. So I want to get that fertility back up, possibly higher than the 81% that it was uh, initially. And this will be my crop rotation at first. Now, what I'm going to be doing is paying attention to my fields. If I start seeing the weeds getting up there and this one run of maintenance doesn't work, then I will change one of my years around and have maybe two maintenance back to back to clean the field up. If I see my fertility getting too low, like below 70%, I'll take a year, I'll take everything out, and I'll do two runs of clover to get me plus 10% fertility back. So you do have to kind of pay attention to your fields, pay attention to what you're doing with them, and see if there's something you need to do that might help improve the soil quality, or if your weeds are getting too out of hand, just take a year, and just let it lay fallow and just do maintenance. So just do some clover growing. Whatever you need to do on it. These are not static. You want to change them around on occasion. Uh, once you have a couple of, uh, once you have two or three fields, uh, you'll do some interesting crop rotations between them. Uh, we'll take a look at that here in just a second. We'll pop over to a more advanced game that has several fields going and take a look at some ideas you can do for that. Now, speaking of fertility, real quick, there's a couple of things I do want to talk about. This is early game stuff still. Later on in the game, you have things like cows and all this other stuff for fertility. But early game, you'll have a compost yard. You'll have to have a compost yard. Your people have poop, and they need the poop picked up. What this does is once this gets to 100%, you can click this. This will give you the option to select it, and you can add the, add the compost to a field to grow greatly increase the fertility. That would let you get away with not having to run clover for a little while. And maybe instead of having to run clover, I can maybe run another thing of food in here or something if I wanted to. And so that's another option right there for fertility. It does take a while because the compost does gather kind of slowly, but eventually it will fill up and you can add that compost to a field to greatly increase the fertility. So again, another option, that way you don't have to do the clover. I don't have that right now. It's going to be a little while until I have that at 100%. So the clover is what I'm going to have to do. All right. So for the last thing, let's take a look at a slightly more advanced game of farms and see how you can do some certain crop rotations. So you have a, a certain amount of food coming in every year of the same kind, but not from the same field. All right. So let's take a look at a two field setup right here. Once you have two fields set up, it's a, usually a good idea to start rotating the same setup between them one year difference, if that makes any sense, basically. Uh, so let's take a look at this crop field right here. Year one, we're doing leeks and clover. Leeks are greens. You need greens. People need greens. It helps prevent scurvy. So we're going to do leeks and clover. Then we're going to be doing a field maintenance Buckwheat. Buckwheat is an excellent alternative to regular wheat uh, because it has lower uh, fertility dependence. It has a shorter growing time. It doesn't give as much of a yield, but it is still pretty decent and everything. And it doesn't get as disease as fast as regular wheat does. So it will still work for like your grain farms and stuff. So you could do some buckwheat and then we have turnips. And then the final year of the rotation, we're doing cabbages and beans right there now if we take a look at this field right here we have basically rotated it around leeks and clover are the last part of the rotation with cabbages and the beans moved up here and then the working buckwheat and turnips up there and i am building another farm and i will essentially rotate that around again as well what that will get, do for me is that means every year something of these are being grown. Having three fields because of the three year rotation is usually ideal. That way you can rotate stuff between it. That means every year I'll be getting leaks from some field. Every year I'll get some buckwheat and turnips. Every year I'll get some cabbage and beans. 
So once you have the population and you have the additional workforce available, it's a good idea to go ahead and get those farms set up in groups of three so you can start rotating your crops every year and have a steady supply of the same foods coming in at all times. That way your people don't run out of certain things that they might need and they might get sick from scurvy or you don't have any sort of wheat for your mills, for your bread and everything. So make that consideration when you are setting up your multiple fields. Try to do them in groups of three. And don't forget, you'll always need greens. And once you have access to the bread, you're always going to need wheat going on. So throw those in there. And still go back to my earlier advice about every so often, take a look and see if you need to do a full year of nothing but maintenance or a full year of nothing but clover. Stuff like that. Now there's one other little quick tip I want to talk about, and that was the field size. We're going to go back in time to the field size. Try to get your fields around 10 by 10. Try to get a 10 by 10 field eventually. Okay. The reason being is a 10 by 10 field is the same size as the grazing pasture requirements for cows. And when you have a clover run going, put the cows in the fields for the farms and they will also raise fertility because of manure. So there's another little tip right there. Start with five by fives or a five by six and eventually make them at least a 10 by 10 so the cows can go in there and graze on the clover and help increase fertility as well. So that's my little farming guide, uh, at least to start. I'm sure I may do it in a more advanced one later on, but this hopefully gives you some of the information you need about how this system works. So you can go in and get your farming started and at least start learning the system and figuring it out and decide what crops work for you and what rotations work best for you. If you have any other advice or tips and tricks about how you do farming, leave those down in the comments below. And with that, thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video. Until then, take care.